Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Jordan with PictureMonk.com, and welcome to episode 15 of the Picture Monk Photography Podcast. And uh, this one's going to be really jam-packed. Uh, i got about four main topics that I kind of want to discuss and uh, and kind of review a little bit. So let's go ahead and roll into it so we can get this thing going. The first one is a, a a new piece of software that came out that's in beta right now. And uh, it came out, uh, it was just announced, I guess, a little bit earlier this week. And it's uh, what's called Affinity Photo. And it's a new, what they call a quote-unquote Photoshop killer. Uh, and so what it's basically is just a, a Photoshop-like f- uh, a photo editing program. And it has... A lot of features. It's more, it's more like a feature, feature enhanced Photoshop killer. What, what a lot of one, a lot of uh, people would call it. Uh, there's been others out there. Like when GIMP came out, people were saying that was a Photoshop killer and, you know, it was going to hurt Photoshop because it was free and it can do a lot of the basic stuff Photoshop, Photoshop could do at that time. And, and so there, this ain't the first time then, uh, there's been a Photoshop killer out there. And so, um, I've actually downloaded it and it's, uh, it's a, like I said, it's a beta right now. I've actually downloaded and played around with it a little bit. And, uh, to the short answer of it being a Photoshop killer is by no means will it ever kill Photoshop. It's got a lot of great features and, uh, it, it actually mimics Photoshop very, very, very well. Uh, one, I, I got in there, I downloaded it and, uh, within a couple minutes, I knew my way around because it was, you know, almost exactly like Photoshop in the way it's laid out. Uh, even some things are labeled almost exactly the same, um, which that could be, you know, I guess in a way that could be copyright. I don't know if it can be, but so, you know, I played around with it a little bit and I just, I don't know if it's because I've used Photoshop for so long or, or, or what, but it's, it's, um, it's not to my taste, I guess. Um, there's a lot of quirks in there, but again, this is, this is a, a beta. Um, and it's, it's, a it's, it's just not something that I, I liked. I mean, it was a little bit laggy on my system. Um, I do have a, a an iMac that is, I bought, oh, when did I get it? In 2010. So it's five years old. Uh, it still holds up well on a whole bunch of other, you know, programs, including Photoshop, but it's, you know, it's still laggy on uh, Infinity Photo or Affinity Photo. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, I, I liked it okay just to play around with it and test out. Um, but it's not something that I would, I would use right now, at least in a, uh, a regular workflow capacity. So, um, if you want to check it out, you can obviously do that. It's a, it's a free download as of right now in beta. You can go to affinity.serif.com. So that's A-F-F-I-N-I-T-Y dot serif, S-E-R-I-F dot com. And, uh, in the top, I think it's the top right, you'll see a uh, little banner that says download the beta. And, uh, you can, you can play with it re- for yourself and see how, how you like it. Um, it's going to be a $50 buy when it does officially come out. And right now it's only for Macs. Uh, I didn't, I forgot to mention that it's only for Macs. There is going to be a PC version coming, but the, from what I've been told or read about here, it's, it's, uh, it's more, they want to nail down the Mac version and get that going. Um, but yeah, check it out for yourself if you're interested. Uh, if you, if you don't use Photoshop a lot, maybe this will be something that you can, um, you know, get instead of having to pay the, the creative cloud version for, for $10 a month, you can get this and, and use that instead. So, um, go ahead and play around with it. Let me know how you, uh, how how you like it. And, uh, you know, maybe it's something that you could do in the future and, and play around with. All right, the next thing that I want to kind of go over is what I'm calling a mini review. I'm going to try to do these in a couple podcasts, and it's basically um, I'm going to take a product that I've that I've had for a while and been able to test, and kind of do a, just a mini a mini glance over and kind of get my thoughts about it. Nothing like an in depth review like you would see on uh, you know YouTube or something where they take like a 20 minute video and go through the ins and outs of everything. Um, so what I'm basically doing is I'm going to take a, a product that I have and just review it and give you my thoughts about it. So the first uh, mini review that I'm going to do is actually of my Canon 17 to 40 millimeter f4 lens. Uh, I've I've actually done a written review about it, but I kind of wanted to go over it because I've noticed that that particular blog post has been getting a whole lot of 
um, a whole lot of clicks. So I wanted to kind of go over that real quick and, and just kind of give you the, the pros and cons about it. And, um, and maybe if you're interested, you can pick it up for yourself. So, uh, like I said, it's my Canon 17 to 40 F4, uh, ultra wide angle lens. And it's, uh, it's, it's an L lens, but it's, it's capable on, um, a crop sensor camera or a full frame camera. And when I first got my Canon 6D, I had to get rid of uh, uh, pretty much all of my lenses, minus my uh, can my little nifty 50. You know, I had to get rid of all of them. So uh, I knew that when I got my new camera, I really wanted a good wide angle lens. And the uh, the one that I really saw a lot of people talking about, I think, is the 16 to 35 lens. I, I think it's 16 to 35, something like that. Uh, I looked at the, the price of it and it was really, really expensive. Even used, it was really expensive. And so kind of went for the, um, you know, what's the next best thing that was in my price range. And it turned out that the 17 to 40 got really, really good reviews. And, uh, it, it was, it was an F4. Uh, I could have went for the F2.8. Uh, but again, you pay for, you pay for that. So, um, I just kind of, you know, kind of went through in my head what I, what I would be using this for and would I really need a F2.8 to, to go down that far. And I, I, I wouldn't have. So, um, some of the benefits that I've seen from the lens, uh, and, and I've mentioned this again on, uh, the written podcast that, or the written article that I have about it is, you know, almost zero lens flare. I've never had a lens to where I could have no lens flare. Even if you're pointing it directly at the sun, you're not going to get anything. Um, you know, 45 degree angle from the sun, you're not going to get anything. You, you know, even with the lens, uh, the lens hood off, you're not going to get any sun flare, which is great. And I've, I really, uh, I really enjoy that because I hate, I hated having to, you know, take my, uh, I think, I, I think I just used my kit lens. The widest that it would go was the 18 millimeter on my old camera. And, uh, I would just, uh, you know, have a heck of a time trying to clone out all the lens flare and all that kind of stuff. So, um, I've noticed that zero lens flare is on this, this lens. And that's really, um, really been a noticeable difference. The next thing that's been really, really beneficial, especially since this is a ultra wide angle lens is, uh, very minimal distortion. Um, I still have to, you know, apply the, the camera profiles to, correct some of the converging lines and stuff. Um, but it's, it's nothing major. It's, it's nothing that the, uh, default camera calibration can, can't control. And, uh, you know, even if it gets so bad where I have to go in there and I have to mess around with the, the distortion, it's, you know, it, it, it really does fix itself a lot and it's really easy to correct all that stuff. So I've noticed that that's a, that's a really good thing, especially cause I, I wanted to get it, um, in, in a hopes of, of taking a whole lot more real estate photography and, and interior photos. So, you know, especially with that, you got a whole bunch of lines going at you in different ways. So being able to not see a lot of distortion is, is really great. And, uh, that's, that's one thing I was looking for as well. All right. And the next one is it's extremely, extremely sharp. Um, usually with wide angle lenses, you're going to get sharp no matter what, just because of the, the depth of field and everything. But it is extremely, extremely sharp. And, uh, I, I usually do apply sharpening as you've probably noticed in, in some of my other podcasts and blog posts. I do, I apply sharpening in, in most of my photos, but it, 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 honestly, I really don't necessarily have to, uh, with this lens, even, you know, even around F, I don't know, F7 or some F, or FF7, F8, somewhere around there. It's super, super sharp. So that's really great. And, you know, it's, I, I don't even know why you would want to get the Canon 16 to 35, I think it is. I don't even know why you would want to get that just after having this lens for a while. Obviously, you know, that one little millimeter might make a, um, might make a difference, but, um, yeah, it's just really sharp. And, uh, you know, that's, that's something that's really, uh, really, really beneficial, especially with all the landscape stuff. Uh, you really need that good depth of field. So in these mini reviews, what I'm going to try to do is kind of give a little, uh, you know, one out of 10 score. And I'm actually looking at my notes and I made it a one out of 100. <laughs> so I'll need to change that. Um, but it's, I'm trying to give a one out of 10 score to, uh, to try to see, you know, weighing all the pros and cons. And, uh, I've really haven't found many, many cons to this, many bad points. 
for this lens, except for the price that could, you know, depending on what your budget is, that could, uh, that can impact it. As of right now, if you wanted to get it brand new, it would be about, uh, I just looked on Amazon, it would be about $839 at the time of this recording. Uh, and that was completely out of my price range just because I, just, I spent, uh, $2,300 on a camera. So, I needed to kind of cut that back a little bit. I, I actually did buy it, but I bought it used and I uh, made sure that the seller had really good ratings. Um, I did buy it used on Amazon and I uh, just went to the used section and it came with the original box. It came with the bag that the lens came in. It came with the lens hood. Uh, the only thing that it was missing was the actual lens cap. And that's, that wasn't a problem. I just went on and bought a generic lens cap from Amazon and it fit just right. So. Um, my one out of 10 score is I'm actually giving this a 9.5. Uh, I, like I said, I couldn't find many cons except for the price. And, uh, for a lot of people, $839 for a lens is not that big a deal. But for me, I got it for around 560 or so. So, um, so yeah, if you, uh, if you want to check that out, go to, uh, picturemonk.com slash Canon 1740. So Canon 1740. And that'll redirect you to uh, Amazon for the uh, for the link there, and you can and you can check it out and see if you want to grab that for your um, you know crop sensor or full frame camera. Obviously, if you put it on a crop sensor camera, you're not going to get that massive depth of field or the the massive focal length. You're not going to get that wide angle of view. Um, but if you are rocking a, a full frame camera, you're going to see how uh, how wide angle that can get. All right, so the main topic of this podcast is I kind of wanted to give five small, quick, super easy tips, tips or tricks, I guess is what you would call them, uh, tips for photographers to use with social media. Um, the social media obviously is a big deal when it comes to promotion and getting your stuff out there. And uh, before I start this off by these tips, um, I'm by no means saying that I am a social media guru or expert or anything like that. I've just d- been trying a bunch of different things, uh, and a lot of them are super simple, but we just kind of forget to do them. Um, so I'm just trying a bunch of different things and, you know, seeing what kind of, what kind of works and, and what kind of doesn't. So maybe you guys can, you know, not have to deal with the, the struggles that I'm kind of going through to get my, my, my work out there and get my, um, my other, blog posts and stuff like that, uh, seen by a lot of people. So, uh, the first one is uh, really easy. It's basically just use Pinterest. Make sure you use Pinterest. If you're not using it, you're missing out a lot because I have, I have a lot of clicks coming through my site from Pinterest and, um, a lot of photographers do use Pinterest, but you could use it differently and, and get a better result. So what I mean by that is if you, uh, it, it, let's say you do a, a portrait shoot for somebody or something like that, you know, you want to make sure you put a good image out there for the, for the board, for the pin. want to make sure you put a good uh, image out there to, to attract somebody. Um, but a good way to do that is to make it a very, very tall or long, uh, image. Um, so the, basically what I do, if I'm trying to put something on, on, uh, Pinterest, I'll bring whatever I'm going to do in Photoshop and I'll just crop it to where it's really, really a, a long, uh, a long, f- uh, photo or advertisement or something. I'll crop it to where it's really long and then I'll try to fit all the, the good stuff in there. And that's where kind of, you know, my, my graphic design mine comes in because I want to make sure everything is, you know, oriented and, and it's got that right hierarchy of, you know, the text here, image here and that kind of thing. Uh, what I recommend if you're, if you're doing that, you know, if you're, like I said, doing a portrait shoot, get a portrait or get a, a photo. That's a really good photo that you give you gave to a client and just crop it to where it's really long and then add some text in there saying, you know, portraits available, something, 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 you know, whatever your price is. And then, um, once it's the pin is actually posted, uh, open the pin and then you'll see in the edit box, you'll see a link to thing. So that's the thing where that click, where someone clicks on the photo and it'll take them off to, you know, your blog or your portfolio or something. Um, make sure you put in a, a good link to take them to. And then also if, if you're a local photographer, fill out the location section there. So if somebody does a local search for, for that, they'll see you and they'll see that photo and, uh, and that'll get their attention. The reason you want to do a, a very long one is, you know, just think about when you go on Pinterest and you look at all these boards, 
you know, some of them are scrunched up because they use a, a uh, horizontal photo. So it's, it's, you know, lesser known. But you have you you know if you ever seen some of those photos that are you just super super long because they put detailed steps in everything, and uh, you know finally Pinterest just has to cut them off at a certain point, and uh, once you click on it you can see everything. You want to make sure you take up as much real estate as possible on on that Pinterest board, especially if they're looking at it on a mobile phone, because Pinterest is usually limited to uh, two columns. So you're gonna get like a scrunched up thing for somebody else's stuff, but then yours is like taking up. You know, they're still scrolling up and down to to see your pin. So you want to take up as much stuff and get a really eye-catching photo and uh, and stuff like that. So basically just bring it into Photoshop or whatever whatever editor you have and, uh, you know, crop it down and try to just squeeze some stuff in there. And uh, I can almost guarantee you're going to get some hits off of that because it's really worked well for me. And uh, so just give that a shot. All right, the next one is really easy as well. Don't be afraid to use hashtags. This also goes for, you know, all the social medias. It goes for Google+, Facebook. A lot of people will forget to use Facebook hashtags. I don't because I just really don't like Facebook. Um, but, uh, you know, on, on Twitter, definitely use hashtags. So don't be afraid to use hashtags, but don't overuse them. I, I mean, I try to stick to three at the max, and, it, and those three have to be pinpointed of exactly what I'm working with on this image or blog post or something like that. So uh, make sure you use them, even if you're just throwing in the hashtag photography. You know, put that in there if you have enough character counts at the end of your tweet. So uh, be sure to use hashtags. Um, you're going to get a lot more, a lot more communication, a lot more hits back from that. And um, you know, if somebody is is looking for for inspiration and they search for photography, you'll be up there. So that's a really simple one to do. Just remember to do it. That's the hard part. All right, the next one is kind of a kind of a hit or miss. It's uh, make sure to use Google Plus, even though you know that thing is dying out really quick. Um, you know, Google Plus came on the scene, and a lot of people thought it was a, r- a really good direct competitor to Facebook. But uh, I have not seen a whole lot of traffic come from Google Plus. Uh, I still put my stuff out there just because you know Google Plus is Google, and you want to kind of be nice and get in good with Google. And uh, so, you know, I still put my stuff out there, but um, I basically just carbon copy it right from from Twitter or Facebook and pop it on there just to say it's on there and kind of get some some good traffic coming from uh, from Google. And another reason you might want to do this is especially if you're a portrait photographer and trying to advertise your business or or, uh, you know, you want to. You want to have somebody, uh, you know, recognize you from from that area. It, it's also good to use like location keywords. So uh, one of my goals, I guess, would be to not only you know promote my Picture Monk site and everything, but for my personal portfolio, I want to be like you know completely concentrated on Greensboro, North Carolina, because that's where I'm at. I want everything. I, w- I basically want to be the you know the shiz for for Greensboro, North Carolina. So I want to, whenever I put stuff out there that from my personal portfolio, I need to hammer it home about Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, you know, and then I, you know, once I get some good, uh, some good traffic coming from there, then I can move into, you know, other surrounding areas and just North Carolina in general. So even though Google Plus is kind of dying out or it's, it's, even if it's not dying, it's just staying, you know, completely dead, you know, like just stagnant right now. You know, use it, and you don't have really have to put a whole lot of time and detail in it. Just use it, and make sure you lose, use location keywords. All right, another one is to uh, use YouTube if you can. Um, YouTube and Facebook, Facebook videos, and uh, and those two things. If you can, you know, get up enough courage to get in front of a camera. And do that. Do do it if you can, because it's going to help you in the long run. Um, YouTube is, you know, again owned by Google, so you kind of want to get into all their little, you know, all their little special interests. And so uh, I'm trying to think of a good scenario. And the the two that I kind of came up with were, yeah, again, going for a wedding or a portrait photographer. You know, put a video on there, just like you know, doing a complete you know, a uh, cop out Ken Burns effect slideshow and popping your photos in there and just talk on, on a mic. Uh, it doesn't have to be a good mic. Just use your iPhone or something and just, you know, talk about the photos and say what kind of businesses and services that you offer. And, you know, and, you know, find me at www.blahblahblah.com 
and uh, you know, just have your photos going there. And then in the description, use all those keywords again for local, uh, local keywords, and um, you know, kind of hammer that home again. Because when people do searches for you know photographers in North Carolina or something like that, um, again using my state as an example, you know, if they do that search, Google will filter. Uh, social media results by location. So, uh, you know, if you, if, if you keep hammering home that you're in North Carolina or you're in California or whatever, if you keep hammering home that you're in there, eventually you're going to start creeping up the search results and you're going to get more hits that way. So if you're, you know, a portrait or wedding photographer, keep hammering home that you're from so-and-so state and you're going to eventually get up there and get more hits. So, uh, YouTube, Definitely use that if you can. Um, even if you do do a regular slideshow with music in the background and put your logo and your contact information in the, at the end, you know, do that every once in a while with your new shoots and everything. Um, just do that, and you'll get you'll get more and more uh, hits over time. Again, it's not going to be a quick fix. You're not going to put a YouTube video up there and all of a sudden get 15 more clients the next day because you uh, you know you put a video up there. Just you know, keep hammering home. Take some time. Patience is the game. And the same thing for Facebook videos. Take that same video, pop it on Facebook on your uh, your 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 photography page, and uh, just let let the hits roll in because more people will see those. Because you know Facebook is trying to concentrate more on video, and I guess that's a kind of a stab at uh, at, at YouTube. So make sure you do that and and just pop the you know videos in two different places. It just takes a little bit of time just to you know put them in in both. All right, and the last one kind of goes along with the whole hits uh, search results thing. And write write just simple blog posts. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a 5,000 word post about why this photo means whatever it means. You know, it doesn't have to be anything like that. Just make sure you write a, a, a good blog post and, and try to do it consistently. And, uh, you know, I, I switched over my personal portfolio to Squarespace. And that sucks because I, I had a, I was, I was recently on Zenfolio. That's where I had all my blog posts from, for like two years, two or three years, I think. And so I had all my blog posts on there. And when my, you know, when I cut off that service, I lost all of those blog posts. So now I have to go into uh, Squarespace and start rebuilding my personal blog uh, about my personal work. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm doing that with PictureMonk.com. I'm, I'm putting blog posts out there every day. So that's that's a different side. But, you know, in, in the uh, personal portfolio stuff, that's where I want to start writing more blog posts about images that I post and, uh, and posting to social media, again, using keywords for location services and stuff like that. So uh, make sure you do that. You know, write a simple blog post. About, um, you know, I, I went out with so-and-so and we shot this today and just throw some images up there, throw a couple little, you know, paragraphs and, and you're done. So, uh, the more you write, the more you put them out there, the more, you know, people you would get looking at your work and, um, you know, you'll, you'll definitely feel, feel more uh, eyes looking at your stuff and getting more comments and everything like that. So just those five simple tips will start you in the right direction to getting more, more hits. And again, I'm not a social media guru or expert or anything. I've just noticed that these five things, even simple being simple things, they, they have started, you know, helping me get, uh, get more eyes on, on not only my business, you know, picture monk stuff, but also my personal portfolio. All right. And the last thing I want to go over is what I'm, I, I can't figure out a, a creative name to do this, but it's a, I think I've did, the, I did this in a previous podcast. It's like a product of the week. Um, and it won't be a thing that I'm doing every week, but I just, I found this, um, cool, cool little inspirational thing and, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to go over it. So I'm calling it a product of the week, even though it's not technically a physical product. It's actually a free thing that you can do on your own and you can actually do it while you're listening to this podcast to, uh, to give you kind of inspiration to get out there and shoot and to what kind of, what kind of things you can, you can get out there and, and take pictures of. So, um, you might hear a little sound in the background because it kind of involves a bunch of post-it notes. What you basically do, and, and uh, you might have to listen to this a couple times to follow me here, is um, you basically get just a stack of post notes, and it helps if they're if they're uh, colored differently. 
mine are not, so I'm trying to keep these, you know, together and make sure they don't it gets separated here. Um, but it's kind of like a, a flash card game in a way. So what you do is, uh, you get, you know, a couple stacks of post-it notes and you put, um, for mine, I put the time of day. So I have a post-it note for uh, sunrise. Uh, I got one for midday, I got one for sunset, and then I got one for nighttime. So I have four, four post-it notes over here with those on there. And then I have some more post-it notes, and I have uh, subjects on them. So I have a portrait, I have a landscape, um, uh, let's see, automotive, I got one of those. Um, let's see, what's the other one? Uh, abandoned stuff, like abandoned buildings and stuff like that. Uh, food, I got a food photography one. And you basically just take those and put those in a stack. And then uh, the next one is a style one. So this can be sort of, you know, anything that, any kind of style that you usually do or may not even usually do. Uh, any kind of style you can think of. So it can be like high contrast black and white. It could be, um, you know, a vintage, a vintage yellow look or, you know, a yellow green look of, of faded colors or, you know, anything that you can think of. Uh, it could even be some sort of like cropping thing. So you can do like panorama crop, panorama crop or, you know, anything like that. So just get a bunch of those and write one of those on each and each post it note. So I got about five there. And then the last one, um, I'm only doing four categories is a lens. And the reason I did this is just because you get more challenges with a lens. Uh, if this isn't making sense, just hear me out. Um, so uh, the last one, I have a lens. So I wrote down my wide angle lens that I just kind of talked about. I wrote around my, uh, I wrote on my, let's see. Yeah, my 50, my 50, uh, 50 millimeter. And then I have my just kind of general walk around lens. And that's my 24 to 24 to 105 kit lens. So that's the lenses I have right now. So what you do is you get these in, in four different piles, and if you want to make more categories than this, you definitely can, but I just did four. And what you do is you basically just shuffle them up. And so I'm going to shuffle them up right now. So And, and what this does is it kind of gives you a, 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 a starting point to take a really cool photo. So I'm going to shuffle them up. Okay, and so the first one I'm going for is the time of day. So I want to make a killer photo, and I want to make it at sunset okay so there's my sunset category and so uh, what I'm going to shoot my subject so I'll take those and I'll shuffle them up okay and I'm going to take a portrait so I'm taking a portrait at sunset okay put that to the side and now I'm getting style so I'll take the style and shuffle those up okay Ooh, black and white. Okay, that's going to be tricky. All right, so <laughs> normally you don't see a lot of black and white sunsets. Uh, so let's do another one. Let's do the lens. Okay, and shuffle those up, and I have wide angle. All right, so in this little flashcard game, I have to take a portrait at sunset and edit it in black and white, and I have to take it with my wide-angle lens. That is a triple whammy right there, because, um, yeah, usually when you're shooting sunsets, you know, you want those real vi vibrant colors. Uh, you're not going to get that with black and white, and definitely a wide-angle portrait. So if I had to do that right now, the only thing I can think of is doing it at sunset, but not even worrying about the sun sunset portion of it. I would like kind of concentrate on um, like the lines that gives you the shadows that it gives you and then the wide angle I probably wouldn't go in close I would have to uh, I would probably get the portrait of somebody but in the surrounding area so like it would it would also be an environmental environmental portrait so maybe like in the city and have leaning up against the building but then having like the shadow of the building in black and white so you can kind of see what it kind of gives you and you you know, you shuffle them up and get another kind of, kind of scenario. So, uh, I just thought that was a cool little game. Uh, I saw somebody doing something similar and it was, it was actually for, uh, 
since I'm a, a graphic designer, it was actually for a graphic design project and they were trying to figure out how to, how to market something. And I was like, oh, cool. Why can't you do that with photography? So I kind of came up with this little game. So if, if you want to try that out, you know, let me know what you kind of photos you would take. And if you have any other categories, let me know what you, what else you think you could go in there to uh, spice it up a little bit. So I thought that was pretty cool. And let me go, you, let me know if you guys try that. I'm actually going to play around with a couple little more and see if I can get a couple of uh, little other, other scenarios to play around with. All right, everybody. That was the end of the podcast. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Sorry. It was kind of jam packed in here, but I, uh, I'm actually proud of myself. I broke the 30 minute mark of the podcast, the first 30 minute podcast. So, uh, but that's about it. I appreciate you guys joining, joining me this week. Uh, head on over to picturemonk.com again for a bunch of other stuff. Uh, this, this past week, I actually did a Friday freebie about, uh, 500 PX maps. If you've never heard of that feature, it's a really good feature to kind of go along with the flashcard thing, um, for inspiration on how to, uh, how to, uh, you know, take photos in different areas around you because it pinpoints your location. So check that out. Um, again, head on over to picturemonk.com slash podcast, and that'll redirect you to iTunes. And I would appreciate it if you guys review, rate, and subscribe. I would appreciate that very much. Uh, it really helps out the show and uh, keeps me motivated to make more. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's, it's, it's fun. So, uh, especially pl- getting to play a flashcard game on a podcast. So uh, anyway, I uh, hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. I will, uh, I'll probably see you guys in the next podcast. Um, but for the stuff discussed in here, be go, be sure to head over to picturemonk.com slash PMP 015. And I'll, uh, I'll make sure to include all the, uh, all the stuff talked about on this episode. All right, guys, take it easy and have a good week. <laughs>